what are the functional areas of my investing business? I got my deal finding, I've got my due diligence and underwriting and funding, I've got my actual um, um, uh, management systems, and I've got kind of more of my archives for property information. And I might have one more, which is for kind of more of an administrative stuff going on in the business. But those are kind of my five main areas. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Sensing, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the Gene Eddie in the house. Gina Barra, Gina, how's it going? I'm doing good, Mr. Stenziano. I am excited that I'm <laughs> next to you. I can touch you today. Oh, I man. feel the energy. Oh, so this is going to be a good podcast. You know, that we've got a great guest now. We've got great content going on. So, and uh, we're both together talking systems from the saint in Saint Augustine with Gino today. <laughs> Today's guest is David Finkel. David is an ex Olympic level athlete turned businessman. He has helped over a hundred thousand clients create and sell their business assets. So without further ado, David, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here, guys. Thanks, David, for coming on. I just want to say you've been on a show previously with us. Uh, everyone, take a look at YouTube. He's written Scale. He's written Build a Business, Not a Job. And we're going to be talking about his next book today. So he has a ton of content. He has a ton of value. So I want everyone to pick up a piece of paper and a pen and get ready to take some notes today. David, let, let's see, uh, uh, you know, for the YouTube folks out there, let's see the, uh, the new book. You want to hold that baby up there? <laughs> yeah, the freedom formula, how to succeed in business without sacrificing your family, health, or life. I wrote this one a little bit out of preservation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit out of preservation. Before we dive in here, give us a, give us a brief overview on it, and then we're going to get into the questions. Yeah, so after I, I, I was trying to play in the Olympics, I played on the U.S. national field hockey team. I was the captain of the team for a number of years, and I got hurt right before the 96 Olympics. So I started a business. It was a business in real estate. I started off buying and selling single family houses, renting them out. And as a lot of people do, we start cutting our, our teeth with a few houses a year, then going to a few dozen, then a few hundred houses a year. And then I moved into commercial real estate, apartment complexes, office buildings, et cetera. I built a real estate training company. The high point, we were coaching about 1,500 to 1,800 coaching clients a year. Wow. And then about 15 years ago or so, I sold that company. And uh, since that point, I still do my investing in real estate because it's a great part of my asset allocation. But at the same time, my core business now is how do I help people build a business versus just owning an activity, owning a job? And I'd say probably about, oh gosh, maybe about 15 to 20% of our coaching clients are people who are trying to scale a real estate investment company, not just doing real estate. That's not what we do anymore. But how do you build it as a business? David, Give me some points on what makes a person successful when they start scaling businesses as, as opposed to being the typical mom and pop owners. Because Jake and I run into mom and pop owners all the time. We love to buy from them. What do you see the difference in those two models? Yeah, so I'll, I'll do one from the, the model and one from the mindset. Let's do the mindset first. So most mom and pops, what happens is they have this medical condition and it's a serious one. It's an inflammation of their control gland called controlitis. <laughs> and uh, they, you know, they try to do everything themselves or if they have people helping, and I know we'll get into that today, they basically are command and control. You do this, check back with me, and I'll hand you the next task. And when they become a taskmaster, and they, that, that helps them. They can 50% more, double, maybe even triple, but there's a ceiling to where they can grow because they don't have anyone else's attention to manage the complexity. And the people who burst through that ceiling, they're the ones who've actually built a, a team that can not just get their hands, but can get their, their, their head and their heart too, their, their thoughts, their, their attention, their best judgment, their discernment. And so I'll give one quick example how to do that. So I'm holding up an index card. Those watching on YouTube can see it. A friend of mine, one of my mentors, she's a phenomenal businesswoman, built you know, a, a, a nine-figure company, um, was a former chairperson of the National Association of Manufacturers. Her name's Stephanie, just a, a wise person. She's in her mid-70s, just one of the people I truly respect and admire. And she one day challenged me. She said, David, take out an index card and write the following question. And the question was simple, but it changed a lot of how I approach building companies. And she said, write down, I don't know. What do you think we should do here? Mm -hmm. And every time a team member comes to me with a challenge now, my reflexive response is, read my darn index card. I don't know. What do you think we should do? David, should we kick this tenant out? I don't know. What do you think we should do? David, this tenant um, wants us to replace all the carpeting, repaint, and change out the appliances. I don't know. What do you think we should do? And, and it gives you three things. Number one, it lets you see how mature their judgment is. 
if one out of three times they're correct and two out of three they're wrong, you know you have a doer, not someone who can think just yet. If, they're, if they give you a good answer eight out of nine times or nine out of 10 times, you've got someone you can really trust to hand more responsibility. The times that they're correct, number two, just say, you know, that sounds like a good per plan. Go ahead and get it done. And then if you want to, you can say, close the loop with me when you're done. And then the times that they're incorrect, this would be my third point here, just correct them intelligently. If there's someone you're trying to grow, we'll talk about coaching for development versus coaching for results. Ask them questions. Don't tell them what to do. Don't rescue them. You know, when you said you wanted to do that, tell me for a second, Jake, the reason you wanted to do that was what? Hmm. Have you considered this? If you couldn't do that, what else would you do? Hmm. Do you think that might be a better answer? Go ahead, Jake. I, I, so I, I think we're going to take this to the next level right now because I love exactly what you're saying. But I, I also would like to say, what does our operating manual say? What do our procedures say? And if that doesn't exist yet, how about you write it for us? Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Hey, you know, we have, we have a system about that there. And, and, and you know, you said something there, and we're going to just, just touch on that. Can I change one word, just one word for what you said? Sure. Which is manual. Let's get rid of the word manual because here's what I've, I've noticed, and, and, and this has just been doing this with about, in the last 10 years, maybe 10,000 different companies. When they start thinking of manual, they start thinking policies and procedures manual. And that becomes a, something you create once, put on the side. Uh -huh. Very few people refer to it, plus it becomes dated very quickly. Today's world changes too fast. So systems, to get them to be used, we need to have them be a living, breathing thing. And so we call it our UBS, the, the ultimate business system. It's just a, it's a way to say, make it a noun and a verb. Hey, you know, Gina, let me ask you, did you add that to the UBS? Hey, you made a change here. You found this cool new software product that we're using now to do all of our, our uh, notices for all of our tenants. Did you do a video and add that video to the UBS or did you UBS that thing? So if you can make it an ongoing thing that in our company, we create, we use, we refer to, we reshelf, and we delete when need be systems. Now people will use them. It's got to be part of business, not just a, a one-shot deal that's delivered from on high saying, thou shalt follow the <laughs> manual. <laughs> and, and the great thing is now with, with Google Docs and, and these different uh, you know, softwares that are out there, it's very easy to do, very easy to update, very easy to keep it fluid. Uh, another thing that you mentioned uh, that I found very interesting is, is just talking about the overall system because we early on were like, okay, to get in the game, this is what we tell people, education times action will equal results, meaning yeah. that will help you get into your first deal. If you get educated, you take massive action, that will help you get into your first deal. But from there, it all comes down to people, systems, and culture. So that's really our day-to-day -day because we're in the game, we're established. Day, day in and day out, we come to work focusing on our people, our systems, and our culture. Can you comment on that? Yeah, first of all, that's a great, that combination is dead on correct. It's funny, we call that strategic depth. Those are the three elements that we, we look at with that. And, and so one of the things I'll mention, I'll just give an example. I watch a lot of investors struggle to find deals and they find a deal, whether it be a fourplex or 400 unit apartment complex, doesn't matter. And then now they're scrambling to get the funding for it and find their investors for their down payments and do their, their underwriting of the deal and their due diligence. And then they're trying to get it leased up and the repairs done. And so they go from finding deals to doing the deal. And what happens is they go these cycles of feast or famine because they stop doing their marketing activities as yes. soon as they get wrapped into the other. And so systems are what save you. And I'll give a quick example. So we have a, a coaching client for a number of years. Um, he actually graduated successfully. His name's Randy because he, 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 his business is hands off for him now. But the, the deal for him was originally he did the same thing, feast or famine. He did a lot of single tenant, triple net lease commercial buildings, but he also did some residential as well. And so I'm like, Randy, look, you found your best deals from two sources, right? From real estate brokers in, in your state, because he does it in, across the entire state of Texas. And then the second source for you is you found off-market opportunities directly by getting to the property owner who is at an age where he or she just wants to get rid of the property or it's their heirs. I said, why don't we formalize this? Why don't we make this a system? And so what, what just do you like, for example, the real estate broker side? So he said, great, put together your simple database, your Google Docs spreadsheet or whatever you want to do of, of the 50, 60, 100 brokers or agents in the communities that you want to buy. Put together a simple one page, this is what we're looking for. And with a cover letter, let's, let's make sure that we have a quarterly process that you touch these people every quarter by phone and by 
an actual email fax or actually old fashioned letters work well. And you don't have time to do this. So let's get someone else in your office. His name was Austin, who we got, who was his son, who worked in his business. And it was such a simple process. And the letters were easy. He was already buying, what, two, three properties every year. And these, so he was buying probably anywhere from 8 to $15 million of real estate every year. He owned 50 buildings. He was a credible person. So it's just like, you know, hey, you know, we, we buy two or three properties every year. We're looking for one or two more. Here's the criteria of what we're looking for. You know, if you find the right opportunity for us, we will close. We've got the funding for it. And, and, you know, we've already, you know, in our partnership, we already have close to $220 million of real estate. We're looking for more. And just that keeping fresh in front of them, because that's all it takes. So he started doing that. And it's funny. It's amazing. He started doing deals and finding more deals coming in behind, which allowed him to have more strength in his negotiation when he found due diligence items that concer concerned him. Whereas before... He was a little bit desperate for that because he wanted to make that one deal work. But when you have a flow, so that's an example of, mm -hmm. of a system part, but kind of get into the nitty gritty to make that stuff work. You know, the, the thing that screws people up is they stop doing it. Um, they, and the same thing on the operational side. You know, they manage properties really well for the first couple months when they're turning it around and they're taking it over. But six months later, 12 months later, they kind of drift. Even if they have professional management, they're not managing the professional management very well. They're not having their review on a monthly basis with the management company. They're letting that slide for two or three months. And then all of a sudden, they discover that their economic occupancy is a lot lower than they thought it was. And they get, you know, they get in trouble that way. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that a lot. So let me recap for the listeners out there. I want everyone to write this down. The ultimate business system. I love that. Get rid of the word manual. It's called the ultimate business system. And this is the other thing that I want everyone to write down. I don't know. What do you think we should do? And to me, what that does is you're coaching up your team. You're also empowering them. You're including them in the conversation. And especially millennials, they're not there just for a paycheck. They're there for the greater good. They want to be part of something. I want to be part of something. So if I'm included in the process and I'm elevated and someone really values my opinion, that's how you coach people up. David, I can give you an, an example from this past weekend. We had a couple of our team members speak at our event. Um, they came out there, um, no monetary gain, right? They were out there for the weekend, but what it did to them, it elevated them in, in the company. It, it just surrounded them. We gave them a lot of props. They did a fantastic job and they feel more empowered and they feel part of the team. What do you think, Jake? I mean, how do you- No, I mean, you think about it. It's, um, you have some folks that are rising in their careers. They were able to share stage with ourselves. You know, Eric Thomas, the number one motivational speaker in the world. So it's, it's a big thing and that helps create that culture piece. We touched on people, systems, and culture. That is that is part of the culture piece. But, you know, to your point, when you ask an employee, you know, what do you think? And then they come up with a solution. They own it at that point. So no longer it's you told me to do this and, and it's screwed yeah, up. No, you, you own it now and that's your baby. So you better pull it through. And that's the accountability piece because you're telling them who's going to own this. And then you say to them, okay, you do it. Just report back to me. Let's put something together. And then you guys can work on it together, but they're taking the lead on it. So that's how you're actually outsourcing and leveraging time. Yes, I hear you both say that. What comes to my mind. So one of the reasons why I wrote the Freedom Formula is this idea of how do I get not just my myself focused on those things that create the highest value so I can create more value in a lot less time, but how do I get my team members to focus on the right things? And I'll give an mm -hmm. example. I was talking two days ago um, with a, a, a listener of this particular podcast. His name's Mark. And so I met Mark originally. I guess he heard me on your podcast about a year ago, or maybe it was nine or 10 months ago. And he found us with that way. But Mark was talking about his team. And the conversation was, you know, how do we get our team to focus on the right things? And his, he does different types of commercial real estate and some residential real estate still. And for him, the, like, for example, we have a, 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 we call it the one page plan of action, a simple one page format where every 90 days we do a rolling plan of action. What one, two or three focus areas in the company and what are the concrete criteria of success and who owns what by when? But if I can put it in one page where everyone sees it, well, the conversation came up. He followed it the right way we're doing it. But again, this was the first time he actually had his staff doing their own plans of action. And what I shared with him, and I'll share with your listeners, please, 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 two quick points here about coaching up your, your team members. Number one, um, drip, don't drown. Drip, don't drown. You, if you think about it, I remember I built a house. We had this beautiful shrubbery put around. The guy said, hey, we need to water the shrubbery every day so it has deep roots. 
what would happen though if we just dumped a whole you know bucket of water on it, it would wash away all the soil I, i've got to do it in small drips throughout the course of a day a week a quarter a year so small little coaching moments you look at good coaches they don't go pull a player aside and give them an hour lecture they pull a player aside give them 30 seconds to maybe five minutes of a quick conversation and put them back in the game drip don't drown number two gentle pressure applied relentlessly. Now, I learned this one from a friend of mine, Steve Maxwell, who's one of our, our coaches at our company, but he's also a really good investor. He's bought tens of millions of dollars of real estate, residential and commercial. And his comment was, you know, if we're going to drip, don't drown, the idea behind it, if I want to grow my team members, I've got to do it slowly, but relentlessly. And so, for example, for Mark, I said, Mark, the first time your team does an action plan for their area of the business, you know, you've got your your main guy in your commercial real estate business, your main person in your mortgage business, your main person in your brokerage business, they're doing an action plan. Don't worry if they do it perfect. Let them just start getting some muscle strength, some muscle memory in there of how to do this. The next quarter, you can give them a little bit more coaching. By the third action plan team members do, they feel much more rooted and confident. Generally, the first time they do it, they feel scared and a little bit overwhelmed. And here's what they'll say. They say, are you adding to my plate? And the answer is no, I'm not adding more. The action plan just says, out of all the things you could do with the, the limited discretionary time that you have, let's make sure it doesn't get absorbed into junk email and other wasteful stuff. Let's put it where it matters. So for example, you know, maybe it's you're going to have someone do that deal finding system. Or I'll give it another example. So we, we work with this guy's name is RC. His number one focus area for a quarter was about his investor relationships. And how does he systematize how he works with them? Well, that's great. What it did for him is it took what used to take him probably 10, 15 hours a month to manage these relationships with the people who had invested in his different projects and reduced that in half. Why? He started to organize who he needed to contact so he wasn't scrambling with that. He started batching it, doing it in, in, in a systematic way so he wouldn't just reach out to one investor. He might write cards for others. He created a system for the reporting on a monthly basis for his people. Simple things like that. And, and I think what really is important when you're creating this, this, this sense that we want to empower our team is to help them understand the priorities and the focuses for the company, but recognize it's going to probably take them 6, 12, 18 months before they really, they really internalize that stuff and, and don't expect it overnight. Jake and I are culprits of this drip, don't drown. We drown, don't drip. Because when you're a creator and you have so many ideas flowing through, you have to understand that people don't work at our speed. And it's That's just right. because we're make it happen and we just love to do this stuff. And sometimes we drown people. So that's something that we really have to be cognizant of and just be aware of it. And I think coaching and business coaching and scaling up, that really helps people when they're stuck. And even in the real estate, because you can overwhelm others just because you can do it doesn't mean that the other person can do it. And I can give you a perfect analogy or an example. I'm sitting at a conference, you know, picture this. I've got Joey Coleman there and we're going through our customer experience journey from assess to advocate. I love this because it's not reactive. We're being proactive. And he looks at me and my, you know, my community director, Josh, and he goes, you guys created this product for yourselves, not for your students. They're not going to be able to do it as quickly. You have to pull back the reins and being aware of that and letting them know that it's taken three weeks to go through a session, not three days like you built it, was a game changer for me. And I became aware and I became empathetic to that process. I was like, okay, this is how I'm going to create it now. And I'm going to slow it down. We brought on a whole new model of accountability coaches on top of our expert deal coaches, where the accountability coaches are allowing the students to work at their pace. When they're done, let's get on a call, make sure you did all your homework. And let's go to the next one. So being aware of that to me was, was, I don't want to say life changing, but it really changed my business. What do you think, Jake? Gina, Gina said, here's everything. Go, here's everything. go. <laughs> and so, you know, it needs to be, yeah, it needs to be broken up a little bit more and easier for folks to digest. And that was a definite aha moment. Does, for does that make sense, David? It does. And it was interesting. So most of the people who are listening to this, you're, you're the quick start person. You're the person that's going to go out and make a deal happen. And that's great. The strength for that is that you're, you're just, you don't need someone to motivate you. You just need someone to kind of point <laughs> you in the right direction and, and uh -huh. just basically say, go, like you just said. Mm -hmm. Behind the scenes, though, the staff members, here's the cool part about it. While they might not be as fast off the mark and it takes them longer, they're the people who will sustain the attention to the detail that that quick start won't. So they're the ones that are going to keep the house running smoothly once it's in motion. 
On the flip side, there's probably about 15% of your listeners that are more of the engineering mindset. And when they do their deals, they're very cognitive, they're very analytic. And so for them, they do need someone in their business who can be a quick start just to solve stuff quickly with that mm-hmm. part. But I totally agree with you. We have to recognize that the things that make us a great business owner are things that aren't necessarily qualities for other people. Go back to Mark. He can learn new subjects very quickly. I can have a coaching conversation with Mark and 20 seconds later, he's doing it in his business. Most staff members can't do it that quickly. There's resistance and it might take them 30 days or even three months before they're starting to do it and six or 12 months before they're fluent. But when Mark gets bored, his staff will still be doing it because they find it comforting to have that regularity. And so there's good and bad to both, but I totally agree with what you're saying. On the systems aspect, how can we systemize our investing business? Yeah. So the best thing I would tell someone about systems, here's the two big mistakes. We talked about one, which is to think about it's a one and you're done. Hey, I create the system and I'm done. It's not. It's a living, breathing, um, cultural commitment in your company. We create, we use, we reshelf and, and, and edit and delete when needed systems. The second one is you don't do it all at once. It's not, a, it's not a light switch that's on or off. It's a progressive dimmer that gets brighter and brighter. So what I do is I start to systematize small areas of the business. And so, you know, the UBS, and for anyone who's reading the Freedom Formula, it's chapter four, and it gives you some pictures and, and some tools how to do that. You create what are the functional areas of my investing business? I got my deal finding. I've got my due diligence and underwriting and funding. I've got my actual um, um, uh, management systems, and I've got kind of more of my archives for property information. And I might have one more, which is for kind of more of an administrative stuff going on in the business. But those are kind of my five main areas. Don't try to systematize all. Pick one. Maybe it's the deal finding systems. And so this quarter, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to organize what do we already have in the deal finding folder on my, on my Google Drive or um, whether I use OneDrive or Microsoft. We, we use a tool called Ignite. It's nothing more than a Dropbox, on, a paid version on steroids. Dropbox business is fine. So I, I take my one area and I say, what systems do I already have? Which are the good stuff? Which is the stuff that's junk that I should just get out of there? It's just clouding it and crowding it over. And then I just ask one more question. What's the one or two systems this quarter that would be most important, most valuable for us to create? And so that quarter, I create one or two more and add it in there. Maybe it's a video for how we do our, our pull our mailing list to send out our quarterly mailing to our property owner database in our farm area, whatever it might be. And then the next quarter, I ask the same question. What one or two systems this quarter would be most valuable? Or I ask the opposite, which cost us the most for not having? And so I just start incrementally doing that. And the key part is if I have staff member, I might have Jody who's in charge of that area in that part of the company. And so I'm giving her a runway to start doing this and she owns that part. And then maybe I can now two quarters later get started in the um, administrative part of the business. And I do the same thing. And I light these little fires and pretty soon after about four, five, six months, the fires kind of catch together and we have one UBS for the whole company. The big mistake people make on this stuff is they overcomplicate it. I go look at their UBS and there's 17 first layer folders in there and they have no organization for how they name stuff. So I go in there and I look for the the rent rolls, but, oh, you didn't call it the rent roll. You called it the list of tenants. Well, I don't find it. So I try to recreate it. Now, every time I go, I correct mine, you correct yours. And now we've degraded our UBS. It's got to be some, some thought in a folder, not by the whole, but in a folder, how do we want to have certain naming conventions? And we name things not for how we want to store them. We name them for how we want to retrieve them. Think keywords like Google, like, you know, do I want to call it a, a rent roll or do I want to talk about my tenants or do I want to talk about my residents? These are small things, but if different people are using different names, they won't find it. In today's world, um, we've been so trained by Google. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist if I don't find it within probably 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. So we've got to make those names to find it intuitive. And then the cool part is it's easy to change things later and rename because all it takes is a right click and a rename as opposed to once upon a time. I, I still remember my first property UBS was literally those three ring binders with a footer on the page that said version 2.1. 
I, oh my gosh, I hated those days. We'd send a, we'd send an email or way back when it was even before email, we would do faxes to each other. Here's the new page. Take out this page from your, your, your manual. By that, back then we called it a manual, <laughs> which was crazy and put this replacement page in. But today it's just so easy technology and it's, it's essentially free technology. I mean, it's such a nominal cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the key to that is it actually ties into the culture aspect as well because you have residents, you don't have tenants, or you may have guests, and you have communities. You have you need to, the right words need to start from the top, and they do matter. And in, in addition to that, I would like to see the alignment come from the uh, property management software as well, so it's streamlined throughout. And that way, if it's going to be a rent roll in the software, it gets carried through to your software that you're building out your systems on. And I think it's key to have those synergies in place. Yeah, and let's talk for a moment here. So the nice thing about it is if I've got a whole bunch of communities and multifamily, there are such good software choices and you guys teach on this and, and that's great. So your UBS is going to be basically all the systems that don't fit into your, your, your enterprise software. If it's in the enterprise software, you don't necessarily need to recreate it. But what your enterprise software won't have is it won't have the, the Word doc with the screenshots of how to get in there and pull the right report. It won't have the four minute video for how to um, do this particular process to send out invoices for people that need to get reminders about rent payments. That type of stuff goes in your UBS, but the software has a lot of the know-how. The UBS is going to contain, contain some of the stuff around there. So just yeah. as a how do you how do you greet a guest when they come in? You know exactly that kind of stuff. I like that. How do you how, <clears throat> how can you leverage your personal assistant to get more done faster? That's an important question. That is, and, and so I'm going to give you quickly four quick points for a personal assistant. So whether it's a full time assistant that literally works in your office. Um, I have two assistants, one that lives about eight hours away, one that lives in my community who comes by my office twice a week and then does all of her other work remote. Um, I've got people who have all their, their assistants are VAs overseas somewhere, the Philippines or somewhere else, whichever it is, four quick points. And, and if those that want more on that, chapter two of the Freedom Formula has a whole bunch more of my best tips. But number one, understand yourself first before I hire the assistant. When I'm working, I have a very limited number of work hours. I'm not a chit chat person. Early on, I hired some assistants that when I didn't talk with them every day and, and ask about their weekend, it created a lot of drama because they thought maybe I was mad or upset with them. So nowadays, I know that I need to hire an assistant that when I'm in the office working because I want to be home with my family for most of my day, they know that it, they don't take it personal about that stuff. I also know that I'm an auditory delegator. So I like to give my message, uh, my, my assistant, I use an app called Voxer here. I'll just pull it up right now on my phone for those who are watching. So I, I pull up Voxer here and uh, I can, with one touch of a button here, leave a message for an audio message for my assistant. And what used to be where I would say, okay, twice a week, I'd sit down for half an hour with him or her. Now, throughout the day, I might leave three, four, five, 60 second to three minute messages. And as long as my assistant knows that's my style before I hire him or her, I'm golden. I also, I hate getting audio messages back. So they can't leave me a Voxer back. I want it in writing because I can read four times faster than I can listen. Plus I can have the notes right there off of what they've done. So again, there's no right or wrong. I've got clients that want to text everything to their assistant. I've got others who want the social interaction with their assistant. Just know what you're looking for. Number two, you've got to have one place for everything that your assistant is responsible for in a list most times where I've seen mistakes happen, and I was guilty of this a decade ago, my assistants used to manage their deliverables, their do stuff in their inbox. Worst place for them to manage it. I'm always wondering, did they get this? Did they get that? So we used to then go to spreadsheets. Today's, you don't have to do that. Go to Asana or some kind of project tool. As long as it's all on one list, and I'm going to be a nerd here because I like Lord of the Rings. You know, that one scene where they say, one ring to rule them all one list to rule everything your assistant does. And here's what happens. As long as I see it on that list, I can relax and I don't have to remember it because I know he or she's got it. Um, the next one I think is really important for your assistant is you're going to have to make sure you don't hire drama. Um, I, over the years, I've had probably 15, 16 assistants over the last 24 years for four different companies. And what I've learned is some people are drama magnets. They just pull it into their life. I cannot hire a drama magnet. Um, I, life's, I've got three kids. That's enough drama in my life. You know, My wife and I, we just had our 16th wedding anniversary. There's enough drama in, in the marriage, right? I don't need it for my assistant. So just don't hire drama. If you notice it, get rid of it right away. The drama, you can't have it. 
Um, and then my, oh, uh, you, you got, I got, you well, we're, we're talking Lord of the Rings now. And I just want to, I want to quiz you a little bit. So do you, do you remember Anduril? I don't. Okay. I that don't. was Strider's sword. Oh my gosh. Really? So we're, okay. we're, we're taking it to the next level. So it, it's usually when I'm at home, it's usually sitting bes- behind me in, in the, in the image. So we usually have that's that. That's the one that had the broken tip then. Yeah. The, so, the sword that became whole. Yeah. Oh and man. We, re- we cool. re- reforged it. So when we do get the drama, off with the head and it's gone. You got to you got to cut it off, right? You got to remove it. So you can't uh, you can't great. let it fester. You got to remove it. I think that's the key because I think the longer it sits around for, it's just like regardless of how much they're doing, you got to cut the drama out because it's it's just gonna be soul sucking. I love what you said with that. Although I'd be scared to see the training video on the drama in your company. <laughs> yeah, man, there might be, you know, it might be uh, a little full contact, but we we get it done. So. That's great. The, the last one I'll give you for an assistant here, just, just real quickly, and I think it's important as well, which is de- um, when you go ahead and do a delegation session, whether it's for five minutes or for half an hour, make sure your assistant, not you, but your assistant pulls out her phone and she records it. Why? Because she can listen to it a second or a third time, answer nine out of 10 of her questions, and it saves you the trouble for it. Plus, what you'll find is your assistant's going to be a lot less stressed when she comes in your office for, for whatever you need her to do, or you're sitting down in his, in his uh, front area in the reception and you're handing him a whole bunch of stuff. It lets him not worry that he's missing something because they'll go back. The right assistant wants to hear it a second or a third time so they don't miss something. And it saves you time. And considering you're probably your time value from an economic standpoint might be 10 to a hundred times more valuable per hour than what you're paying your assistant. You, you need to make sure you leverage your time well. So everyone out there needs to write this down. The first thing is to understand yourself. We use Slack uh, at, for to, to um, you know, between companies. A couple of people overseas love that, so we use that product. Um, number two, there's one place for everything. Number three, don't hire drama and whip out the sword if Woo! you have to. And number, <laughs> and number four. I think he just did a stab, though. Was that, was that a slash or a stab? Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> and number four, pull out the phone phone and record. So that, that's really important, those four. Uh, and like David, you referenced in the book, where can they find the rest of it in the book? Yeah. So chapter two is going to have some of my best stuff about that. Like, for example, how do you have your assistant build the system for being a great assistant for you? You're going to have turnover in that role. If they're great, you're going to promote them. If they're great. not great, at some point, they might work somewhere else. So those things are going to happen. So in the freedom formula, chapter two, has some of our best stuff, including stuff about email and how to manage that and design your email system better to save time, considering what a big suck that is of time. So how can I grow and develop my team? I've got these assistants working with them. What's the next step of growing and developing the team? Yeah, so let's step back one step first. So here's what I say. I was talking with a real estate investor uh, three days ago, and he's a guy that lives up in the Bay Area. He has maybe $70, $80 million or more of of real estate residential, mostly apartments. And, you know, he's got his, his, his uh, army of VAs is what he calls them. And that's great. They do a lot of really good work and he's done great with the accountability and how he structured this, but he's got no one managing them in terms of telling them and thinking about the business, about what they should be doing. So his world is, I have to keep being a taskmaster, assigning out all these tasks to feed the beast. And what he doesn't have is anyone else who can do the the handing out and thinking of what's going on in the business to, to own functional areas of responsibility. So the key wording with that is I don't just want someone who can do tasks. I want someone who can, quote, own functional areas of responsibility, unquote, in my business. I want someone who can own um, the underwriting side of my business. I want someone who can own managing um, the communities that I have. I want someone who can own um, our marketing across the board. I want someone who can own um, the resale of our properties. Now, they don't have to all be internal people. And the nice thing about real estate investment companies, there's a whole horde of really good third-party service providers that I can use for pieces of that, but it's a very different mentality. So now that I know that, for example, Lori and my company, she's a rising star, I have to be careful. Am I coaching her for results or am I coaching her for development? And I want both at different times. The difference is when I'm coaching Lori for results and she comes to me with a problem, I just give her an answer. Do this. Here's why. When I'm coaching for development, I say, well, tell me what you think's really at issue here, Lori. You know, how have you handled this in the past? How did that work? I ask these series of questions to help guide her to the right answer herself. It takes probably three or four times more time 
to coach through for development on an area versus coaching for result. However, I might have to do that two or three times for one type of challenge, and now she generalizes that and handles everything else that comes in like that, versus if I coach for results, I will always be coaching that person for results. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask myself that. And then I'll give one more, which is we get into trouble. You know, so for example, let's say I have two team members. I've got, you know, Jake and Gino and Jake in an area is really skilled. If I manage him too closely, he's going to say, David, back off, man. I got it. Why are you micromanaging me? Gino, if I've got you in an area, it's a brand new area for you. You know, if I, if I back off and just say, here, do it. You think, why is he abdicating this to me? He hasn't showed me any of this stuff. So I have to adjust, and here's the, the secret question you ask. It's so easy. It's so obvious once you hear it, but I just pause and say, in this function, where is this person on a one to 10 scale in terms of experience and skill at this function? If they're an eight, nine, or a 10, I clearly hand off and let them run. If they're a two or a three, I probably have to do it with them, with them watching me do that. If they're a five, six, or a five or six, it depends. If it's a high stake situation, they should be doing it with me. If it's a low stake situation, you know what? Give it a go and let me know how it goes. We'll see what you learn from it. Mm -hmm. But we call that the spectrum of capability, one to 10. And it's not in general, but it's for a specific function. And if they're a high score, I have to manage them differently than a mid score, than a low score. And just by pausing for 30 seconds to think about it, I'm now a much better manager of other people. And that's probably one of the most important lessons that I would share for, for a listener or viewer. So I think everyone out there should Google this word. It's called an empowering question. So what Dave has been talking about is what we learn in life coaching, right? An empowering question is an open-ended, thought-provoking question. And that's what coaching is all about, letting people come up with the ideas. Because most of us have the answers within us. We just need it to get pulled out. If you, if you and ask Close ended questions, yes or no, there's no power to that. So Google open ended empowering questions and see what comes up, and you'll see the what kind of questions. What can you do about that? And perfect. you know, what do you think? That's a perfect uh, empowering question. So as you're coaching your team, I think everyone should focus on those empowering questions. And, and the second half of the freedom formula, I'll just mention the first half talks about how do you get you and your staff to focus on the right stuff, the stuff that creates the most value. The second half, we share these five accelerators of which coaching your team, building a leadership team. The, these are all these accelerators that make this stuff go faster. Mm -hmm. And there's some really good stuff. We've been coaching now for over 20 years. We've taken our best practices that we train our coaches on, and we've shared it right there in the book. I mean, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. How do you have a coaching session? How do you actually hold someone accountable in a way that they feel good about and still holds the business responsibility the right way? How do you grow leaders, not just people who do stuff? And, and these are solved equations. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, what is the single biggest mistake that you see investors make when scaling up the team though? Yeah, so I, I still would tell you the number one mistake is they, they think that I'm gonna save money, but I'm gonna find task specific people. And they end up with a sprawl of, of tasks, people who do these micro functions and what they don't realize is they've got no one who can do the thinking for what's going on. So they're, they're, they've scaled. They're, they're now doing three times more, but they're working not just as long, but they're actually working 20, 30, 40, 50% more hours. And it's just a house of cards. I'll, I'll give a quick example. I was actually having a phone call. This is about six years ago with a Canadian investor who owned roughly about half a billion dollars worth of commercial and residential real estate. Guy was incredibly successful from a, a number standpoint. Now that was Canadian dollars, so you know probably 200 million in US dollars. And I was talking to him and he kept getting interrupted. I'm laughing, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm at one of my mobile home park communities and I'm, I've got tenants who are leaving and I'm just doing a walk through inspection and after they've left my, I'm like, are you a nut? <laughs> He's in his seventies. He's still doing that part of it. Why? Because he's got all these task specific people, but he's got no management at all. And I'm just shaking my head. And, he, you know, at 72, he was not going to hear it from me. Um, even if I had solved those equations, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't going to take it at that point. What's going to happen, sadly, you know, he's going to have a heart attack and his adult children are going to argue because he already had shared some of this stuff. Mm. They're going to argue over his real estate empire. And basically, not only are they going to just sell it in a fire sale to people like all of us listening, but number two, and this is the sad part. His kids will never speak to each other again because of money. It's just such an ugly thing. He could have avoided all of that by handing them an actual business that can function without him so that when he's gone, 
the kids don't have to argue. The kids, if he wants to leave them some of that or all of that, great. But it's a it's a functioning thing, and and now it's a healthy thing. And he he wasn't doing that. So that's this. That's the unfortunate thing. Multifamily business lends this. You can create a business with multifamily. You want to hire people. That's the idea of getting into this and scaling it up. What is multifamily? What is what is real estate all about? I mean, uh, the three three basic human needs: food, clothing, and what? Apartments, baby. So those are the three <laughs> human needs, right? Food, clothing, and apartments. And once you buy the apartments, you can hire the property managers. You can hire the maintenance. That's the idea of actually getting into this business. It's not just tenants and toilets and trash. It's really getting into and scaling up. Now, when you first start out, you're obviously going to be a little bit overwhelmed. But the end, end strategy, when you're looking at the exit strategy of anything, you want to build this business. You want to be able to hire and pay people. And I think that multifamily is, is one of the most ultimate vehicles to do that. Can, can I give one more idea? On this? So one of our sure. clients that we were working with, he was doing this thing, but he wasn't sure where he stood. And I, I made a simple suggestion. He did it and it changed the way he built his company. I said, do a fire drill. So he had, I think it was like 30 different partnerships going on for different, different properties. And I said, pick one of them. Pretend like you weren't there and your number one financial person wasn't there for a 30 day period. Could your your other staff, could your other advisors that you have, the CPA firm that you work with, could your wife and your adult kids, could they step in and know what's going on? He did it one time, a disaster. I mean, within a couple of days, they had to go back in and do that. But now what he does is once a year, they do a little bit of what we call a disaster drill, a fire drill. And it lets them gauge exactly where they are mm -hmm. um, on that part. And if you've got multiple properties, pick it on one. If you can't do it on even one property, you know, you're, you're one accident away from your family, not only having all the distress from you and, the, and all that emotional storm, but leaving them with a mess. And don't do that. It's, it's not that hard. It takes work. It's not that hard, though, to structure things better and to build your team so they can handle it, internal and external team. That's mastery, in, in my opinion. When you can create the well-oiled machine and step back and simply you know, play to the orchestra, that's, that's where you want to get to, and that's the ultimate objective. So, gang, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Hello, everybody. Jake and Gino here, and it's that time of year again. Rand Cares is looking to feed 20,000 hungry children this fall, and we can do it with your help. Our mission is to improve the lives of others by creating communities that allow people to become the best versions of themselves. Brand Cares was created to help further this mission. Please visit our Jake and Gino Facebook page and click the Rand Cares link pinned to the top of the page to donate and help fulfill our mission by feeding 20,000 hungry kids this fall. Thank you for partnering with our family of companies to make a huge impact in our community. All right, and we are back. Now, I love talking about habits, but I want to talk about how you're or how you have taken your teams and been able to change the habits within a team because we, we talk a lot about personal habits, but I think taking a team that's maybe on the wrong track and changing those habits can be instrumental into, into business growth and development. Do you have any examples of how you've been able to achieve that in the past? I'll share it with directly from our own company. So if you would have gone backward in time, seven, eight years ago, we were really good about teaching certain parts, but we weren't really good about doing it ourselves in our company. And so what I found is if I want somebody to be part of my culture, I ask myself, what's the one behavior element quality that if we had it across the company would have the biggest impact? And I realized for us, is we were a business coaching company. If we just did what we told our students to do, Imagine how much more successful we would be. <laughs> so we created. What you preach. That's right. So we, you know, I I recognize that you know, I come from a background way back when of direct mail. So I know slogans just get right in the head. They just get kind of like this earworm gets right in the brain. So I said, let's come up with a wording, and we did. We eat our own cooking. We eat our own cooking. And so it started off with me. Hey, at at, at our company, Maui Mastermind, we eat our own cooking. And I started using that with people individually and as a leadership team. You know, hey, if we're eating our, cook, our own cooking, what would we do here? We follow our own quarterly planning process. We do our weekly big rock reports, just like we have for clients that they do that. We make sure that every quarter we say, what's the one thing each of us can do on the leadership team to increase strategic depth? We start doing this. After about 12 to 18 months, I started noticing some of the other managers, leaders in our company start using that same language. That's when you know you started to win the battle 
when other people are propagating this through. So ask the question, what's the one quality or behavior that if we internalized X would do the most to help our business be successful? And then we say, not how do I get people doing it? I don't, that's the wrong question. I say, how do I get that to be part of our culture? Mm -hmm. Culture shapes behavior without people trying to. It becomes the default inside of a company. You think about it. When you're going to go out to dinner with a group of friends and you know it's a fancy restaurant, you know how to dress at a fancy restaurant. Why? Not because someone showed you, but because it's just a cultural expectation. When you go to a family restaurant or like, for example, I, I hate people who talk in movies. I'm, I'm like one of those shushers in the movie theater. But when I go to watch a movie with my kids and it's a Disney film, and it's a matinee, I expect every kid in that audience to talk up a storm. And I'm not going to complain because it's a kid's movie. The, the culture, the context tells me how to behave and what's expected. So in my business, if I have a, an element that I want people to behave, a habit, I ask, how can I, number one, make it into a quick, short, three, four, five word statement? And then two, how do I make that statement part of our culture which means I've got to reinforce one thing again and again through stories, through questions, through um, example, long enough for it just to become the way that we do things there. And I know that I've won. The indicator is when I hear other people saying that same mm -hmm. thing. So I have a story for everybody out there. And Jake likes to poo-poo this. But I challenge all the listeners out there to create your own core values and to create your mission statement. Our core values are people first and unwavering ethics and make it happen. Now, I got a text from Josh the other night from a student who said, sent him a text and said something, you guys are great, you put us all ahead. And Josh just texted back, people first. So I know it's permeating our culture. You can share a mission statement. Hold on, hold on, you said I poo poo this. Well, when you're in corporate America. <laughs> dude, I was, I was leading the charge on this, come on. When, when you're in corporate America, I'm sorry, you poo poo this. And it's funny because when you're not bought in and you're starting to build a business and you have your employees talking back and make it happen. And they know that Gino's gonna pack books and ship it out because I need to make it happen. And that MIH is all over the place. It permeates the culture and, and all your employees and everyone there will start acting with that culture. So I think yeah, really no, important. Gino was referencing the core purpose and that's to improve the lives of others by creating communities that allow people to become the best versions of, uh, best versions of themselves. And, and whether that's our investor community whether that is a residence community, whether that's our employee communities, uh, whether that's someone doing a mortgage with us and, and that community, it's just, we're here to improve the lives of others because we've been fortunate enough to reach a point of financial freedom and prosperity in our lives. So now it's about expanding upon that, uh, you know, within the communities that we control. So it's uh, really, you know, when you think about it, it's root, it's why we get up every day and it's, it's why we push forward with the business and, and that clarity uh, trickles down through the entire organization is, is extremely, it's extremely impactful. So I have a question for you here because we get this quite a bit and I know I have a principle based uh, response for it, but I'm very interested to hear yours, David. Say a student comes up to you, they have 25 to 75 units. I want more. I want to do less working in the business, less I'm a mentality. I, I think you had a phrase for that before. What do you tell them? Say they're 25, 50, 70 units and they maybe have one employee. When do I hire the next employee? How do I scale up? How do I get to the next level? What do you say to that person? Great question. So are they all in one big building or are they scattered in seven, yeah, 17? We'll, we'll say there's, there's, there's three 25 units. Perfect. Okay. And then last question. Well, let me answer it two ways depending on the age. If they're 25, 35, they're probably still in the building phase for themselves. And so they're going yeah, to Yeah, these are scale. people on their come up. Okay, great. So they want to continue to scale. Gotcha. So hearing that, then my answer for them is, is going to be twofold. Number one, how do I make sure that what I have is solid? So how do I start to incrementally inversions? When I think of systems, I take the, the pressure off. I don't create the system. I create a system, version 1.0. Then later on, I'll do version 2.0, 3.0. If the system is important enough, I want to think in versions because I'm going to keep improving it. Technology changes, um, people's uh, behaviors over time changes. I, I want to keep pace with that. So our existing three buildings have to be managed really well. And the thing that gets most multifamily investors into trouble, bar none, is they take their eye off of things and they mismanage the property and cash flow kills them, right? So I want to keep measuring the right things. I'm not going to, you know, how do I have a reasonable quick glance at how am I doing in terms of occupancy? Not from an occupancy, but actually economic occupancy. Um, how am I doing on that? How many on my rent side? I should have enough cash flow for that. 
that I'm, I'm going to be good with that. Number two, as I'm looking to grow, I'm going to be doing a couple of different things with that. Number one, I'm going to buy some incremental help to help at that point leverage me. I'm going to need an assistant. That's a non, non-starter if I don't have one. I probably at that point need at least a half-time, if not a full-time person to leverage me. Um, part of her job is going to be to document what she does. And if I'm really good on the analytic stuff, but I'm not so good on getting deal flow coming in, I might find someone I can hire outsourced to help me find some deal flow. And that could be assistant, as simple as having my assistant, like I said before, calling through and sending a pre-templated email, fax, or letter to a group of brokers in, 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 the, in the cities that I want to invest in and following up every quarter. That could be as simple as having somebody else pull together a list, a title company or someone else of, of anyone who owns a building um, that has you know value of between three and 10 million for a multifamily. I mean, whatever my criteria is. And I'm sending the letters and I'm having somebody else research who the actual owner is and going back through the layers of from the, the Secretary of State websites to find out who owns the corporations. And then I'm hiring them to go to the different websites that are out there to pull up phone numbers so I can call these people. So that type of stuff I can hire through more incrementally. And I don't need a genius for that. Somewhere depending on my cash flow, again, you know, rental units in Oklahoma are going to be different than rental units in, in you know, Miami, Florida for a multifamily with that part. So depending on my cash flow, at some point I want to have a really rock solid management kind of uh, person on my staff to oversee my management company who's doing the day-to-day work with that. I probably don't have enough numbers to have my own in-house management company when I have 75 units. It just economically doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't have enough to have a full-time you know, repair person unless I bought really junky stuff and I'm, I have all that going. So I'm going to probably outsource it, but someone's got to keep a close eye with the management company. When I hit somewhere probably between maybe it could be 150 to as much as 300 units, I'm going to make the decision, do I want to build my own management capacity or not? I will tell you that my feeling is if there's really good outsource management options in the areas that I have properties, I would probably let that, let somebody else handle that part of it. It's easier and simpler. Yes, it cuts into my cash flow a bit, but it gives me my more attention back to find more stuff. If it turns out I'm in an area and there are areas of the country, there's just junk on the management side, I'm going to have to build that capability internally. How would I do that? I would recruit away a good property management person from somewhere else. I would hire a recruiter. I would have them go on and call the different people who work for management companies in that mid-layer side, find out who's unhappy, find out it's someone who already has a job, who's had long longevity, but their manager has been a jerk to them for the last three years. And they're finally with this timing of this recruiter's phone call saying, I've had it. And they're going to come to work for me. So that's a, those are my quick comments for somebody in that situation. You know, I think people wait too long. They, they get too tight fisted and sometimes get somebody in there and look down the road, take the long view, look for growth, not, you know, being able to buy a 2000, you know, more square foot house right now, be patient, look, take the long view and build up the company first and then the Agreed. great goods will come. So, all right. Uh, what's the best way for folks get to get a hold of you and can we get another uh, view of that book you got there? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I can get the freedom toolkit, um, wherever they like to buy books, Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. They can go to freedom toolkit, freedomtoolkit.com. When they get it, they're going to want to definitely get on. There's a, a free value ad that has a series of training videos and all the PDF tools that they can download from the book. And there's some really cool tools that we use with our coaching clients in there. And they can get that. The book Freedom Toolkit, tell, uh, Freedom Formula tells you where to get that. MauiMastermind.com is our website. So MauiMastermind.com. And uh, there's some really good stuff that are on there for somebody who wants to build a business. So we don't teach about real estate that you got to go to Jake and Gino and, and, and for that part of it. But if you're looking, if you say, look, I, I know how to do the real estate or Jake and Gino got me covered on the real estate. I want to know about building the business part of it. That's our core expertise. And we've been doing it now for a decade. Gino, take a look at that. Breaking free of the chains. What do you got to say about that? That's a good feeling, you know, that, but that's just the beginning when you break free of the chains, because that's when the juice and the, and the sole purpose and the passion comes into play. Getting to that point might be hard, but keep your vision on that, breaking the chains free, and all of a sudden you can start focusing on your sole purpose. I think that's a Stevie Nicks song. <laughs> <laughs> G-Dad, what, uh, what's, what's left here? Are you taking us home? Jake, I don't know. What do you think? 
I think that uh, I think that, uh, that, that Gino uh, needs to put a system in place so he can close out the podcast every time. And, yes, and not ping pong it back when I ask him a direct question. But you know, besides that, I think it was great. I, I love the uh, the fact that once you're in the game, you need to focus on people, systems, and culture. And I think everything that uh, you know, we believe in that David was in alignment with, and I really appreciate his time today. Thanks, fellas. I really had a blast here. You guys are a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks, David. David. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody. I'll see you.